Hello everybody and welcome to Planet Sky FF, the world where everything definitely revolves around £50,000. My name's Serge. And my name is James. And we are Planet FPL, but Planet Sky FF when it comes to Sky Fantasy Football, um, the, the alternative to FPL, the growing game, James. The game has opened. But, right. but, but, but it's a waste of fucking time at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, no TV fixtures is such a big deal in this game. It really is, um, yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that we've got two Monday night games that's showing up on the on the website for the first Monday. Yeah, so the reason for that is Chelsea and Wolves have been given an extended couple of days break because obviously they played um, an extra game in European competition after the Premier League season finished. So I think Wolves and Chelsea had both requested, like City and United, to have game week one off as well. Mm-hmm. So we're given an extra two days grace. Quite what the two fucking days is going to do, I've no idea. I mean, what what you can probably imagine with that is one, they'll probably both be on the telly. One will kick off at six, one will kick off at eight. You ain't got to worry about the crowds on that again, have you? So that's probably the most likely scenario. Just, so just, as, it, as it stands at the moment, they're both uh, bookmarked at 8 p.m., but you think one of them might get moved to 6 p.m.? Depends, right? Uh, mm. Between now, as we did a podcast on TV coverage yesterday, if the games get opened up to a wider audience, i.e. if Sky are going to cover cover all the games, which looks unlikely as it stands, then I guess one could move forward to six o'clock. Or, right. one will, or one will be on the telly at eight o'clock and the other one won't be accessible. For, unless you're looking for illegal streams or something like that. Just on TV fixtures, though, which at the time of recording, we haven't got. Now, commonly they do tend to come out late in the day. However, normally the first set of fixtures where you, the TV fix, the TV companies want to like Sky Sports News and that want to make a fucking big deal of it. So I've, I've would, would normally be earlier in the day. So I wouldn't expect the announcement today. It's going to be a mare if it rocks up at 12 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> but anyway, um, but we are expecting it in the next 48 hours or so. One key point on this, and to just try and get your head around this a little bit, just before the fixtures are released for TV scheduling. That Monday night that you mentioned there, Serge, I suspect will be the only Monday night. We think there's a possibility that one of the opening day games will be moved to a Friday night. So the season starts on a Friday night on September the 11th. It did last year, didn't it? Or yeah. quite often they've done that haven't always done it but quite often they've done it and I suspect the lack of availability for Friday and Monday nights in the upcoming weeks before the overhaul between match days four and five suggests that we will have a Friday night game so those game week one fixtures you are I think probably going to need coverage of four days worth of captains however game weeks two three and four I think you're probably only going to need two And that's because they're going to announce this in a block. And remember, the midweeks after each match week is Carabao Cup with one week notice of who's playing in the next round, et cetera, et cetera. So I imagine match days two, three, and four, there will only be Saturday and Sunday fixtures. That's why I think more you'll probably need four captaincies on the first weekend and two captaincies for match days two, three, and four. Now, why that's important to already get your head around is Obviously, if you only need two captaincies, you're not going to have to spread yourself as far as you might be expecting at this stage. That's yes. worth thinking about. Yep. So where you're currently sitting there thinking, oh, I need the, the best of such and such, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I mean, if Liverpool City and, and United, um, you've got at least one of them playing on one of those two game days for those whole three weeks. Between three players, you could have all of your captaincy coverage done. Um, obviously, in game week one, those guys are not playing, but um, we'll, we'll, help, we'll be able to fit, fill up the coverage elsewhere. The, the, for those the point being is, to overhaul. yeah, there's unlikely to be in that first block before the overhaul, there's unlikely to be a game where you're sitting there going, Oh my god, I need a captaincy for Aston Villa versus Fulham, for example. Mm-hmm. That in match day three, that's yep. what I'm saying. Because even in the first game week. They're not going to put Palace and Southampton on the on the Friday night, no. right? As as the opening launch game of the Premier League, they're not going to do that. It's probably going to be Liverpool and Leeds, isn't it? Oh, you sure they don't want to put Newcastle, West Ham, and Newcastle on a Friday night. Yeah. Think, Even I still, think... if if it was Palace, Southampton, real captain Danny ask, Ings anyway, ask, so that's okay. Head head, head over to Twitter and ask after an FPL partridge because if Messi signs for West Ham, like his little video, trust me, <laughs> will will be the Friday night, mate. Will be the Friday night. 
But you're right there. Um, I mean, um, that's probably going to be the one. Um, I don't like... I don't like it when they put newly promoted teams like it leads his first game. Like if it's not hard enough against Liverpool, like making it the Friday night game where if they do get a, a hiding three or four nil, um, it's not nice to join the Premier League, be the first game and then get a hiding. Someone's got, got to do it, but I'm not feeling it. If that Friday night game does happen, it's going to be, in my opinion, one of three games. It's going to be Liverpool versus Tottenham, Fulham v- versus Liverpool. Arsenal. Liverpool Leeds, you mean? Sorry, Sorry Liverpool v Leeds, Tottenham Fulham Everton. versus Arsenal, or Tottenham versus Everton. Those are the only three that they're gonna, from what's available, that they're gonna be prepared to start the season with. Remember, Chelsea and the Wolves games are already booked in for the Monday night. Yeah, they are not going to be going in there. I don't think. Well, maybe West Brom and Leicester, possibly, because West Brom. Uh, I think Liverpool side. being the champions makes sense to kick the season off with the champions. That kind of. But thing. in any case, from a, from a perspective of trying to pick your Sky team. Any of that, you go, right, Aubameyang, Kane, Vardy, Liverpool asset, or Danny Ings even, right? It's okay. We're going to be covered on the captaincy at the start, and the chances of us landing with a, a Sunday, which is shit in the first four game weeks, is very, very small. So the point is, I really don't think we're going to have to worry too much about getting the random captaincy from West Ham or Everton or something. I don't think it's going to be an issue. I really think, so do you think um, we'll be powering into the big boys to captain at the start. You you talked about how last year, as novices, uh, neither of us made any transfers pre-overhaul other than uh, having to cover off Alisson, who got injured, unfortunately. Uh, and this year, you were going to take a slightly different approach, right? You are more open to making transfers in those first four game weeks. But if there's not that many match days within those first four game weeks, then the need to hokey-cokey might might be less. I'm not saying you won't make one or two transfers, but it may only be now one or two. Yeah, I mean, look, things can happen, injuries, etc. And of course, neither the time will weigh up probably if it's what you know if you get an injury in match day two, if it's worth making a transfer, that kind of thing. We'll talk about it nearer the time. You can't you can't plan in your mind for injury. However, what I do at the start is completely dependent on what day Manchester City and Manchester United play in match day two. So I'll give you a perfect example. Yes. Let's say City and United play on the Sunday in match day two. Listen, I'm absolutely making transfers before the yes, first overall course. because I'm going, I can tell, almost tell you with certainty now, I'm going Aubameyang, games one and two. And then on, on the Sunday, I'm selling Aubameyang for Kevin De Bruyne. Mm. And off we go. Yeah, the, where in, in my opinion, those moves will be very obvious when the TV figures yeah. come out. Um, so it's not going to require too much like A or B options. I think those will be very obvious. And then it's just the case of how many do you want to make uh, early on to, to really steal an advantage and try and get ahead a little bit. The one thing I felt I really learned from my first season at the start last year was don't try and be clever, basically. Whatever you mm. think's right, there's a good chance you're wrong. The gains here, in this period, if, if the fixtures land the way I suspect they might, is in terms of staying with the pack at the start, is basically all going to be about the captaincies. Mm-hmm. Go safe. And I think even more so because of that, because you won't need as big a pool of teams to pick from as you will do from, say, game weeks five to ten. Pick safe. Mm-hmm. Don't take the gamble on, oh, I wonder if that guy will start forever and at centre-half and uh, stop. Just don't. Genuinely don't. Don't take gambles early on. I don't think we're going to need to. It's all going to be that we all stay together at the start and then it will open out after the overhaul. That's really where I think we'll be at the moment till them TV fixtures drop and I'm completely fucking wrong, obviously. But I I suspect that's the way to go. And I intend to pick a a side at the start that is very, very safe. I'm be taking any gambles, particularly. The only person I could see myself looking at from a new signing perspective is Werner. It's the only reason because... I think he could be a powerful captaincy play, depending on where those fixtures land. They've got Brighton, West Brom and Palace in the first four mm. before the overhaul. And there's potentially some power there. So he, as it stands, he's the only new signing I could see myself going near. Otherwise, I'm going with people that I know and trust. And so many of these players are so accessible. Have you um, given... Yeah, I mean, the pricing is something that we can talk about. Um, but before we do that, have you given any thought to formation yet based on the prices that you've seen 
No, I mean, it's a common question, isn't it? What's the best formation, et cetera, et cetera. If you feel you need to be flexible at the start and don't particularly know what you're doing, 442 won't be a bad way to set up. Because remember, you can obviously transfer between players in different positions. Suddenly, if you get a midfield injury, you can pick any player in the game, mm-hmm. be it defender, midfielder, or forward. So don't, I, well, I would try not to restrict myself if I was concerned about that. But in terms of the formation to start with, I ain't give it much thought, mate. Mm. I pick, I pick, I put a draft team in just for the sake of it, picking one player per club, looking at clubs that I think I might be interested in. So to be honest, I've already in my head at this moment, I've ruled out the three promoted sides. Leeds having Liverpool and Manchester City, and bearing in mind I'm just picking for four fixtures, and those are two of them, really don't particularly appeal to me. They would only yep. appeal to me, really, if suddenly the single fixture came up against Fulham in match day two, and then I thought, oh, there's a captaincy there. It's incredibly unlikely to fall that way. Yep. West Brom... You may even, if it's Leeds-Fulham, you might even then think Mitrovic might actually be possibly, the better captaincy option. Maybe. And you can possibly. sidestep. I think in that case, you'd probably look at one that's cheaper to just fit into the squad and stay there for the four game weeks. West Brom-Fulham, I'd rule out. Crystal Palace, another one I'd rule out. They've got Manchester United and Chelsea in the first four fixtures. Start with Southampton. None of it looks particularly appealing for me. If the Everton fixture in match day three became a captain necessity, I'm not captain in the Palace player. I'm going to find Richarlison. Mm-hmm. That's where I'd be at. So Palace, I'm ruling out. I can... Everton's interesting, actually, because match days two to four, West Brom, Palace and Brighton are interesting, so I wouldn't rule them out. Oddly enough, Brighton's the other one that I might actually be ruling out at the start. Because I feel the asset that you'll get drawn to with Brighton is a defensive one. Yeah. And they've, they've got Chelsea and Manchester United at home inside those first four. And that's potentially something that would maybe put me off of Brighton. So they're another one that I'm probably not looking at pre-overhaul. Otherwise, I'm quite open to the rest at the moment. I think there are some sides with some brilliant assets that are, are available. I mean, Antonio is yeah. going to stand... He stands out like a sore thumb, eight million midfielder, midfielder, for example. Mm. And uh, his ownership is up to 16.16%. The fixtures don't put you off, though, a little bit, James, for the opening? Well, that's um, the point, because the, the best cheap player in the game, by the looks of it, to start with, is probably, as it might be in FPL with your boy, Ben Johnson, 4.9 million. Yep. But do I want to stick him in for those first four when you're playing Arsenal, Wolves and Leicester in there? The first four is not as bad... As the longer stretch looks, sure. actually. Because that's when City and Liverpool so come into play. It, and... it might be that he's the obvious one to stick in as the budget one. Because we've heard, this, literally just before we've gone on to record this morning, we've heard that Ryan Fredericks has picked up an injury as well. Mm. We don't know the extent of that at the moment. But if Ryan Fredericks is injured, who he's in competition with, then he really does look the obvious 4.9, stick him in, fuck it, forget about it, I'll pick 10 other players. So it might be that he offers a West Ham cover as opposed to Antonio. But I wouldn't see... Yeah, I'm unlikely to be in a position where I'm going to need to captain Antonio in, in the first four game weeks unless that Newcastle fixture dropped on, on the first Friday night, for example. Southampton, Armstrong is brilliantly priced. Danny Ings is brilliantly priced. Mm. St. Maximin at Newcastle stands out like a sore thumb if you want to get involved in them or need to get involved in them. The other two, obviously, to rule out in my head at, at the moment, at the start, of course, of Burnley and Aston Villa. Yep. Because they obviously blank. So I'm not looking at them. Villa have, have still got, in their three fixtures, have got Liverpool. Burnley walk into Leicester straight afterwards and then Southampton. So I'm not in the desperation to be, oh, I've got to have a Burnley defensive asset at the start. Suddenly I'm in a position where in my head I'm already down to 13 teams and I'm probably not going to need the coverage of 11. I don't think the way these fixtures are going to drop. I think the way it's going to drop you could get away with captaincy coverage for probably maximum six teams. I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be quite comfortable and straightforward to start with. Yeah, which is a real blessing. I did look at some of the players um, from Burnley, for example, like Nick Pope at six point seven million. I thought that was a particularly good price. I expected him to come in at a little bit more. I don't know if they. I mean, the pricing doesn't change throughout the season, so they haven't factored in. The fact that he's got a blank in game week one, but um, eventually I could see either Ramsdale or Pope becoming a, a set and forget at 6.7. They're both at a similar price. Um, probably Pope um, because of the reliability, I would say, 
um, which is particularly good. Let's talk about ownership numbers a little bit uh, here. Um, and it's hard to totally judge because unlike FPL, we don't know how many players have signed up to the game yet. Whereas FPL, we know whether it's a million and a half or a couple of million. Um, so we, we see some ownership numbers. There might just be you, me and a couple of others. Um, it might be Paul, Sky Player and FPL and Dan Cox and the four of us make up all the ownership I, stats. I would say... I, I, there's 2,500 players currently in the Tottenham Mini League. I can see that. Right, okay. So if I judge it by that and we say that there's a lot of clubs who perhaps, I don't know, maybe there's 800 Crystal Palace sign-ups so far, for example, there might be 10,000 Manchester United, right? So mm. I think probably it's a fair estimate at the moment, probably somewhere between twenty-five and 50,000 maybe in terms of sign-ups so far. Okay. Now remember, by the, by the end of the game... And this is an important bit of information for the new players. Once we get sort of a two or three months into the season, we essentially, we don't even look at ownership numbers anymore. We only look at the ownership numbers in the top thousand. Now, at the moment, we don't have a top thousand. So this is actually, for a change, it is useful to look at this. If you want to know where to find this, go to transfers as if you're making a transfer. And then there's a drop down in terms of you can search for players by price, last season's point score. And you can also look by percentage and some of it makes very interesting reading such mm. the, the the first thing i was really interested in was um uh, our friend virgil van dyke there is more ownership right now for trent than there is for vvd yeah well at the moment the way it's probably going to drop i'll probably start with both <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't worry about it too much but yeah, look, Van Dyke at 0.3 million more than Trent Alexander Arnold is is an absolute no brainer. Mm. It's Van Dyke all day long. Yep. All day long in this game. I did have a brief look last night as well at some of Robertson's numbers in Sky. And actually, he, he picks up more uh, from a passing tier perspective than Trent as well, which is interesting. Doesn't make him a better asset than Trent, but actually, they're priced just about right in terms of the sense that in order van dyke trent and robertson but van dyke is underpriced at 10.9 million please don't have that confused he's basically an auto pick mm. he becomes the first player in the team essentially yeah. with city and united not playing game week one you are going to want some liverpool captaincy he's an easy fullback obviously salah and mane are going to really appeal at the start but i think you'll find once you start looking at other teams you're going to be looking at people like Aubameyang, Vardy, Kane, Timo Werner, Danny Ings. These guys are really going to appeal at the start as well. Then afterwards, you're possibly going to want to look at the likes of Aguero, Sterling, Rashford, Martial. Remember, these guys are all forwards. Yes, So they are. I think this year, ownership of Liverpool forwards will be really, really interesting. And I think a lot of people will just go, do you know what? Alisson's um, fit. That helps um, me as well. I'm just going to go with the defensive guys as the coverage. I think that's the way a lot of people go. That's certainly my thinking at the moment as well. I, I agree with you on that as well. Uh, goalkeepers, it's clear that um, people that have set up their teams right now have, uh, I don't think, paid the most attention because Nick Pope is the highest owned goalkeeper at 22.29%, which is considerably more than the second highest owned goalkeeper in Allison at 12% yet doesn't have a fixed streak in, in game week one. This is so we why, know the goalkeeper percentages are going to change a bit. This is why for the new players, I keep scre I've been screaming for the last six months, a new player can win this game because mm. there are so many bad Sky players. Nick Pope isn't just the most owned goalkeeper with 22% at the moment. He's the most owned goalkeeper by a distance. Now, yes. hopefully, <laughs> that will change. <laughs> but... <laughs> But it might not. The interesting thing James, on that is obviously... The fifth highest owned goalkeeper is Edison, and he doesn't play either. So two of the top five owned goalkeepers don't play. Well, sixth, sixth is, is Dean sixth Henderson. Sixth is Dean Henderson, who probably <laughs> won't play. Oh, fantastic. David Hare is not far behind. The, well. the next one on the list really interests me is, is Ramsdale. But the interesting thing, I think, looking through the ownership numbers of goalkeepers is this is where you tend to get a real split and you can actually make differential gains by having a good goalkeeper here. We know this. It's not that difficult to get an 11-pointer off a goalkeeper. You mentioned Ramsdale. My instinct straight away is if I want Sheffield United coverage at the start, 
that's where I want to look. The first three fixtures from a defensive perspective for them are pretty good. Wolves, Villa, Leeds are games where you can foresee clean sheets for them. Ramsdale's the cheapest. He's at the sort of price point that I want to be buying a goalkeeper. You don't want to be fucking about with your goalkeeper. It's literally no. goalkeeper for the first four games. That's all Not you're done. looking for. Worry about it afterwards. I think Ramsdale will probably cover that quite nicely. Although, interestingly, just going back to defenders for a moment, Serge, the only defender that's owned by more, uh, sorry, priced at under 8 million that seems to have any sort of decent ownership at the moment is John Egan of Sheffield United. 7.2 million. The three Sheffield United defensive guys, essentially 0.1 between them, Egan, O'Connell and Basham. And then it's a little step up for your likes of Ender Stevens and Bulldog. He's the one that's got the favouritism at the moment because I think he's, he's the cheapest of the three, I believe. And he, he's probably in people's minds because he scored a couple of goals towards the end of the season as well, isn't it? Yeah. But this is another area where actually cheap defenders under 8 million, there's, there's definitely room to find a nice differential at all. But when I say differential, pick a nice safe differential. Amongst these differentials are players that you know will play four games during this period. Don't, you don't have to be clever about it. You know, if you want someone at around 8 million, Lewis Dunk is fairly obvious. Although Brighton, I don't think are a great choice at the start. And there is competition defensively there with the likes of Ben White, for example, who's come back from Leeds. You know that Lewis Dunk will play. That's more my point. Don't take the chance on a White, for example, if you want to at the start, when you don't know if they're going to play a back four back three, if he's going to play centre-half, defensive midfield, if you want to go to Brighton defensively, in that price bracket, go to Dunk, or obviously go a lot cheaper to Tarek Lamptey, who's who's a lot cheaper. Yep. But there isn't, from an ownership perspective, or perhaps people just haven't realised it yet, nobody's picked up mass ownership from these cheap guys. John Egan is the one that under 8 million has got the most ownership at the moment. I like the look of Matt Doherty. Uh, Doherty uh, so do I. At 8.6 million as well. He feels like a set and forget type, uh, uh, obviously, fixtures dependent. Um, so I do like the look of him. I think that's um, one that definitely will get in. Um, I'll probably end up with Trent, VVD, Doherty, and one other cheap, which could end up being Ben Johnson. And then, um, and then see how I can manoeuvre my midfield. And the the other... One cheapie that I did identify, and I, I, I don't really like it as a choice, and it, it kind of depends on me following information on Ricardo Pereira. Again, remember, sorry to repeat myself, you only have to pick players here for four game weeks, essentially. You yes. do not have to give a second thought for any, anything more. James Justin, 6.3 million, 3% owned off the early, early data. Leicester have admittedly managed to City in their first four, but the other fixtures are not too bad. West Brom, Burnley, West Ham. And I just wonder if you need some coverage from Leicester, if that just works better and opens up the forward spot to take off the natural choice of Vardy and you cover it there. So I think Justin's a decent pick, but literally only for the start of the season in the hope that Ricardo Pereira probably won't be back till after the break. In which case, you then really want Ricardo Pereira probably at your earliest opportunity. <laughs> um, in, in terms of midfield, Kevin De Bruyne has rocketed up to 50 Point six percent, unsurprisingly. Bruno Fernandes. Can I just say something as well? If anybody from Sky Fantasy Football is listening, we spoke about it at the end of last season. Give me a fucking about it now. picture. Put his face on there. <laughs> <laughs> He's there long enough now. You can get his face on there. But yeah, uh, you no say surprise. That. The we, two. We, hot... William, William's got no picture. He's been in the Premier League for about 10 years, mate. Yeah, but I suppose they do want him in an Arsenal shirt, not a Chelsea shirt. So I'm going to give him a little bit seem, of that. They don't normally seem too bothered about that sort of thing, actually, mate. <laughs> bit, bit of uh, red paint. The two highest owned midfielders at 50% and 37% don't have a game in game week one. Yeah. So... Look, what we're going to do with the City United guys, it really, I think it really depends on where the fixture falls, be it, be it the Saturday, Sunday and match day two. That's what yep. it's completely dependent on. To be fair, as much as I've said you're unlikely to have uh, a Friday night game, for example, in match day two, it is possible. It's particularly possible for City United. Um, once we know the League Cup second round draw, it's not impossible that they schedule one of their opponents. So who have uh, Chelsea, uh, Chelsea, 
Chelsea wouldn't work for Liverpool. United have got in match day two Crystal Palace. Palace. Uh-huh. So they could put Crystal Palace against Southampton on a Saturday in match day one, schedule them in the Tuesday in the League Cup second round and then have United against Palace on the Friday night in match day two. That's a possibility. But then following that on the Mondays and Fridays in between, I genuinely find it extremely unlikely that they'll be scheduled for Friday and Monday night games. But if you get that scenario, like I said, United and Palace play on the Friday night in match day two, there's every chance I might just say have Bruno and just fuck it, leave it there. Because mm-hmm. I just won't be able to see the, the potential gain off of one game. It, I think it would almost have to be someone that I was going to captain and wanted to get rid of straight away. So it might be something in that case where Mikel Antonio against Newcastle became a single game day and I went, right, I'm going to captain Antonio and I'm going to sell him straight away and leave yeah. the money spare. Leave the money obviously. in the bank. Mm, makes sense. That's, that's the only way in that case that I could see me probably starting with them. Um, the striker department is much um, busier in Sky Fantasy Football than it is in FPL because so many more players are there. Um, the likes of Sterling, Salah, Mane, uh, even Greenwood, Rashford, and so on and so on. Um, Aubameyang, they're all strikers like they should be in, in Sky. Um, and the price points are, are really interesting there as well. I like the look of Mason Greenwood, 87 but it's not a massive jump up to Martial, who's 10 million, and then Rashford's 10 and a half. So there's interesting stuff in the Manchester United assets. They're all cheaper than everybody from Liverpool. Aubameyang, 11.4. Harry Kane is still pricey at 11.7. Um, and then you've got, obviously, Timo Werner's come into the game at 11.1, which is more than Raheem Sterling. So kind of gives you an indication that he's come in with a, with a heavy price tag. Um, there's going to be... It's going to be interesting... I, what, what are your thoughts, James? Are you going to try and go as heavy hitting as you can or are you going to look for a couple of cheapies? Because Mitrovic is eight point something. Danny Ings is less than 10. Danny Ings are very interested in. I actually foresee almost a template on these forward prices potentially developing. Now, a lot of that's going to depend on certain performances like Werner, Harry Kane, for example. But I can foresee a front three of Aubameyang, Martial and Danny Ings becoming a bit of a template this season. Ings and Aubameyang as clear talisman. Aubameyang is laughably, and I mean that, cheaper than what he was last season. Danny Ings up to 9.9 million is actually probably not the respect it deserves after what he did last season. And Anthony Marshall's 10 million, I think. 10 million. I mean, Cheap. bloody hell. If he half, does what he did after the restart. Cheaper than, uh, half a million cheaper than Rashford and 0.9 cheaper than Bruno. So if you're looking like... You'd be comfortable captaining Marshall in any United fixture ahead of, of uh, Bruno. Um, he scored more points post-lockdown. I don't know what Sky points were like, but he did okay. Well, Martial doesn't commonly seem to regularly hit the shot tiers. Mm. Um, he obviously had the great return against Sheffield United in match day 31, 32, whatever it was. But he doesn't commonly hit the shot tiers, but I think that's possibly changing now with his role within that team. And I would literally just be judging that on what he did from restart onwards. So I can see those three becoming a bit of a template. And because of their pricing, it allows you fairly comfortably to get in De Bruyne, Fernandes, Van Dijk, and then cover your other bits, what you need off there. Suddenly you've got a very, very template team. You know, you mentioned Matt Doherty, eight and a half million. It's decent, right? And suddenly you just Mm. think, oh, fuck it. I'm going to need some Wolves coverage at some stage. He'll do me. He'll sit there. Suddenly, this is what always annoys me. We're a, a bit of a template team. And it really becomes about right captaincy choice and right differentials. Yep. Almost th- those guys don't matter other than obviously in the essence, they're a good combination. And the reason I see those three being a template is if you can leave the money aside, you literally just take advantage off of those three of what you can get, right? marshall has got Man City next week. Harry Kane's got a three for one over him. I'm going Kane, then I'm going back. I can see those sort of manoeuvres. If those three players I mentioned perform well, I can really genuinely see it becoming a template front three quite early on. Now, we know that during the course of the season, templates change, etc. But I wouldn't be surprised if those three start really well, that they're all extremely highly owned come game week five. Yeah, one thing we don't have yet is the fixtures. And it's worth saying to all the regular listeners, um, sorry to break your hearts, but next week there is no Planet Sky FF because of Correspondence Week. We're going to be releasing all of our podcasts with our correspondents. It's going to be two weeks before we come back at you 
However, that last episode will be a real final draft before we get into the season. We'll rundown. make it a long so. one. There, there, is, <laughs> there will be a Skypod for patrons next Wednesday as well, though. So, yep. yeah, look, we're doing 20 podcasts next week. I suggest this, is, although it's more FPL focused, I suggest there's some very good things to be picking up from our fan correspondents next week. There will be. Uh, should we look at some of the, the questions that we've had on Twitter? Yeah, let's do that, mate. Have a look. Um, Rob Pick, how are we doing, Rob? Uh, asks the best enablers. Thoughts on Hugo as a goalkeeper up to the overhaul? Like Hugo, 7 million, I think. It's a, it's a decent choice. If you want some Spurs coverage and if you're looking to power in a front three of, I don't know, Aubameyang, Vardy plus Werner, for example, from the start, Hugo might give you a nice coverage there from Spurs. Be very careful on Sergio. I said this on some of the FPL podcasts. Aurea potentially is a very good Sky asset. Picks up a lot of tackle bonus. We know he can get attacking returns. We know there's a potential increase in terms of Spurs' potential for clean sheets this season. My personal opinion is that he could start the season in game week one with us and he might not be there by game week four. I, Tottenham are actively trying to sell him and get a replacement. So I'd be very, very conscious of that. And again, that's another tip. I wouldn't pick any player at the start that you think is under threat of being transferred. I j- just avoid it. Uh, Benny Blanco asks a question. Is it wrong that I've not even made a draft yet because I feel it's almost pointless until we get TV fixtures? This yeah, game is so fair. dependent on them. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically you're right. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. It's good yeah. to it's good to look at the familiarize prices with the prices and, and stuff. And, yeah. Um, yeah, see what kind of combinations you can you can look at. Um, I, our I friend Hector Wilson says what formation looks ideal, and without knowing the prices, you can't really figure out um, where are the budget enablers. Like if if we had a Suyunku, if we had lots of good cheap defenders, you might think a five three th- five three two allows you more power up top or what have you. Um, but at the moment, there might be some decent bargain midfielders, uh, and then that gives you the power up top. I mean, Stuart four, Armstrong at seven point one. Yeah, it's value, decent. Right? Very good value. Four 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 two. As I said, it allows you the flexibility in terms of you know you can sell a defender for a forward, for example, if you plan yourself properly. But the chances are you are going to want to start with a front three, and therefore you are going to be drawn to. And I think in this game, four three three rather than 3 4 three. However, I think you might find that from a pricing perspective, a lot of people may end up starting 3 4 three actually, because there's some interesting ones there in the likes of Armstrong you've mentioned, Mikel Antonio, Alan Saint-Maximan, and a yeah. few others around that price who might be interesting to start with depending on how these fixtures fall. If they don't fall in terms of where you need the spread, then I think, yeah, we're looking at more like people going, right, how am I getting De Bruyne and Fernandes in? And let's move from there. Um, We've got a question from Jeff Holt. In Sky, how do the four main Liverpool defensive assets shape up? I guess they shape up well, right? You've got 10.9, 10.6, 10.2 for the three defenders in Robbo, Trent and uh, VVD. And then Alisson's coming in at eight eight or something like that. All viable, right? Uh, You could pick off. I mean, if... If if the fixtures work, they only need captaincy coverage from say I don't know, Liverpool, Arsenal, Chelsea, Man City, Man United. I might even look at just trying to power in two or three of those Liverpool defensive guys at the start. Two potentially could be could be good. I I think the way I think it will drop, nearly everyone's going to realise by the time we get there. That surely Van Dijk is the better choice. Trent actually pairing it up would be a really nice way to go. I think if you can afford it. Uh, let's look at Welsh Dragon FPL. We've answered this, um, but let's kind of wrap it up and put, put a bow on it. Do you think the first four game weeks is the perfect time to gamble on players who could explode rather than your steady, consistent players who maybe you would include after the first overhaul? Uh, and if so, does anyone stand out? You've spoken, James, about keep it safe, um, get players you know are going to play because you don't want to have to make unnecessary transfers in this time and make sure you've got safe, captaincy options, reliable captaincy. The gambles to an extent, extent to me, are the Chelsea players in Ziek, Harvitz, should he join, and, and Werner. And it's we know the quality of all three of those players if Harvitz joins as well. But it's a gamble from the sense of you don't know how they're going to acclimatise to the Premier League. Do I want to be forcing in the Chelsea player of a price of, say, Werner? when I might have a nice captaincy alternative 
on that Monday night of match day one with perhaps a, a Doherty, for example, might I much go, do you know what? That suits me nice and fine, actually. And then go without, and it allows you an extra attacking option. I feel like they're the gamble. If you feel confident enough to say, I think Ziyech is going to tear it up or Werner's going to tear it up, great. Go and get them. I'm, I'm not saying don't go and get them. I feel like they're the, the gamble. And if it goes really well for you, brilliant. If it goes really bad for you, unlucky. When I say play safe, don't scrap. If you're in a position you're going, I don't know which Leeds asset to get defensively, or just don't. Just learn from it and wait. And then you can make a decision come game week five when we've got more information in terms of how they set up, etc. Leeds have got Liverpool and Man City in the first two, first four games. I'm really not sure I want to be bothering with them to the start. That feels to me like I've got a really good period there where I'm going to get a couple of chances to watch them live and see how they perform and then figure it out there, see if any of the guys are picking up any tackle bonus, that kind of thing. I just feel like they're avoidable at the start, to be honest. But I'm sure we've got some Leeds listeners are thinking, I know which one is going to do this because I know this about my team. In which case, of course, great. Go for it. A, A gamble to me might not be a gamble to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. And that's going to be different for, for different people. If someone thinks, I definitely know that Gineppo suddenly is going to be back in the Southampton team and he's going to tear it up and therefore he's not a gamble in your opinion. Fine. Pick Gineppo. For everybody else, if Armstrong got injured tomorrow, Gineppo would be a gamble for us that we wouldn't take. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. For yeah. Sure. Um, we've got a question from uh, a new Sky player in FPL, Ray Guna. Um, who are the important to own players in Sky? I think you have to take that as a as a two part question, don't you, really, James? So the first thing is captains. <laughs> so it's always important to own players that give you captaincy coverage on the match days. Um, so make sure that you have the best possible options you can afford for that. And then second, you go and look at. I think with Sky, the stats and the points from last year don't lie. Like there's a reason why VVD and Trent and Kevin De Bruyne and what have you, the top point scorers from last year. Very similar from kind of that point of view. It's more interesting to try and find the budget, mid to budget players that rather than just picking up two appearance points, will chuck in a a tier point or two here or there um, to make a two or three or a four or a five. And if you can consistently do that, that also does help. But captain's a good place to start with that. Yeah, and obviously your your budget and neighbours. It could be uh, if we find out that Fredericks is out for six weeks, Ben Johnson at four point nine million is going to be everybody's guy. And you just accept. You might go, well, the fixtures aren't great. Arsenal, Wolves, Leicester in that opening period. But you'd almost just look at it and go, anything he gets me is good. I've got ten players, and just and just accept it as that. And that extra bit of money is going to be the difference between perhaps a, a Ziyech and a De Bruyne, for example. There are, in my opinion. Two players who I know now that bar an injury, I will start with. I don't care whams with their fixture list in terms of what days they land on. And that is Virgil van Dijk and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Those are the two players I can say with certainty that I'll be starting with. And there's a final question for this episode, James. We're going to give it to FPL Joel uh, at JoelS188 on the old Twitter. Do you have any tips for new players trying to understand how the pricing structure differs from FPL? Anything we should look out for in trying to determine value? Say that again. <laughs> so do you, have, do you have any tips on, on players that are trying to understand the pricing, basically, in Sky versus FPL? Because obviously the pricing is, is quite different. One of the things you mentioned, um, I'm not even sure which pod it was on, but um, is that the average price of a player in FPL was six point something. You'll six. Tell, and in Sky, it's nine point something. 9.1. There we go. Um, so there's obviously a 30% increase in the price of players, but then your £100 million budget is only across 11 players, not across 15 players. Is there anything you kind of look at in terms of pricing, or do you just have to look at everybody and try and get your head around it? The, the biggest thing about pricing is knowing what your next move is. Every time you make a transfer, you need to know what the next one is. Genuinely. You have to know. You have to know every time you make that convert, not obviously not in pre-game week one, but every time you make that transfer afterwards, you need to know if you're what the next one is and will you be able to afford that that next transfer. I feel like I feel like what you said there was one of those everyone's gonna pause for a second and be like, Mind's blown. 
actually, that's a, that's a very, very important statement that we need to pause and have a think about. The pricing is dependent on what's your next transfer and can you afford it? I think that's a, a really, really good point. Don't, if you're trying to compare it to FPL, don't. Treat this as a brand new game. What you said, so is absolutely right. Points from last year don't lie on things like Van Dyke, Kevin De Bruyne, what Bruno did in after restart, etc. These things do not lie, for example. Um, there are obviously facets in this game that you worry about less than you would in FPL. So in my opinion, things like XG, when Bruno wants to shoot every time from 30 fucking yards, really don't bother me because I would then be, how many shots is he taking? It's not how many, what's his XG? It's how many shots is he actually taking? Because yep. you'll pick up the bonus when he's hitting shots on target, right? Mm. So there are slight adjustments in terms of the way you look at an asset, for example. If you're trying to compare pricing between the two games don't other than what I said on um, say an example like Aubameyang the alarm bell should be going off that Aubameyang is 12 million in FPL and 11.4 million in Sky and as a clear talisman that alarm bell should be going off to compare that with say Danny Ings Danny Ings is 8.5 million in FPL is 9.9 million in Sky but Danny Ings is still a brilliant price in Sky by the way it's really interesting because that 1.5 saving off Aubameyang could be really important what you've got is a con a real condensed uh, kind of price structure yep. so in terms of say the forwards the cheaper forwards are kind of eight million ish so in, from going from the cheapest up to the most is only about four million difference or so that's part why planning becomes so important etc well said there we go. Um, and that's another episode of Planet Sky FF for you. As mentioned, of course, there's no Planet Sky FF next week. If you are one of our patrons, you will get a Sky podcast next week. Anyone thinking about joining Patreon, do head over to patreon.com forward slash planet FPL, as well as an additional Sky podcast. You'll get a bunch of other features, benefits. We have some prize leagues. We have a Slack channel and, and loads of other competitions running at the same time as well. And September will be free. So if you sign up now, you're basically getting all of September plus a bit of a back catalogue all included. For new players, once the fixtures are out, please don't bother asking me questions before the fixtures are out. But once the fixtures are out, my DMs are open on Twitter and I'm happy to help in terms of advice. The ultimate selection is still yours. If you come to me and say A or B, I'm going to say that that's up to you. Unless it's a, a gamble versus a safe, I'm probably going to say to you now, I would go with the safe option, for example. If someone needs advice in terms of the workings or understanding things, please do just jump in my DMs and ask. There we go. Um, as always, listeners, thank you so much for all of your support. Wherever you're listening to the podcast, make sure you hit the notification bell, subscribe, hit follow on Spotify, whatever it may be. As ah, you get notified ah, as soon as you've got ah, Tell ah, me. Ah, I nearly forgot all the mini leagues are open. Ah, uh, they are as well. Yeah, I got some emails into my inboxes actually saying that James from Planet FPL wants to invite me into a league. So um, do keep an eye on your email for that as I, well. I didn't see that that um, <laughs> that email go around. <laughs> so uh, I can tell you now, the Planet FPL podcast mini league, the pin number is, and I have tweeted this out on Twitter as well, and I will probably retweet again later. It's eight four seven. Five seven eight five. That's eight four seven five seven eight five. If we know you and you win that mini league, we will happily invite you to come onto a podcast with us in ten months' time or whatever to discuss your Sky season and your successes for the season. But my anticipation is that Surge will be winning this mini league this year. There are also cash leagues as well for the gamblers out there. If you want to join in, we have opened. Or I have opened leagues at two pound, five pound, ten pound, twenty pound entry. Sixty percent of the pots are the winner. Thirty percent second, ten percent to third. I'm restricting entry to one of these cash leagues to one level per person. You can enter both of your teams should you want to, but that's to make sure we get four different winners basically. So just let if you want to enter any one of those leagues, again just DM me and say, look, James, I want to enter the the five pound league, for example, and I'll send you the code and that. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sorting those out, James. To all the listeners, as always, stay safe wherever you may be. Ciao for now. Thanks, everyone. Cue music, please, man, child. <laughs>